Welcome, Nigel. Thank Great you to so see much. you. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. joining us. Hey, make yourself comfortable. Okay, we got fancy chairs, they swivel. Yeah, we're in a good place <laughs> right, <laughs> right now. Um, okay, listen, Nigel, just in case anybody is not familiar with your work, I'm sure many people are, but would you mind just talking to us a little bit about what you do and what does Graphcore do? So I'm the CEO and um, co-founder of Graphcore. Graphcore builds a new type of processor to accelerate artificial intelligence, All right. competing with NVIDIA. Um, goes into data centers, you know, really um, new kinds of AI workloads being supported with our technology. You know, lots of customers around the world using the technology. Wow, so competing with possibly the hottest company in the world right now in terms of, uh, in terms of results, that's tremendous. And um, what has been your founder's journey? You know, we've got our founder zone over there, the room is full of founders. Um, what kind of uh, milestones would you say kind of mark your own journey to be the CEO and co-founder of Graphcore today? Yeah, so originally I was an engineer. Um, I was very lucky, I went to work for a company called Altera. Oh yeah. Um, they were tiny when I joined. Um, I think I was employee number 100. Stayed with them for 14 years, through them going public, reaching Fortune 500, became worth 20 billion um, during that period. So, and I was running, ended up running a quarter of the company. So that was a fabulous experience. And then having done that for, like I say, 14 years, time to try something different, thought we can do this in the UK. And we started a company called ICIRA. We used oh, yeah. to come here to Mobile World Congress every year. We were building a uh, software-defined baseband competing with Qualcomm. Uh, we grew that business, raised about 200 million in venture capital, ended up growing it, um, ended up selling the company to NVIDIA, actually. So if you look at the price of NVIDIA stock today, when we sold the company, if you did it in today's money, that would be worth about a 100 billion exit. Obviously, it was a bit less at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, my goodness. Wow. So then we um, spent a few years helping VCs on different companies before founding Graphcore back in 2016. Yeah. Uh, we've raised about um, 700 million in uh, venture capital and uh, scale-up capital for the company. Uh, got about 400, 500 employees in the company. Um, and yeah, fabulous kind of experience, you know, going through those stages of kind of getting to the first million, then growing it from there, growing the team, getting your first funding and then scaling. Um, fabulous experiences. Oh, I love it. So that is like such a, a classic founder's journey. But the thing is, behind every great founder and co-founder, there is that germ of inspiration. There's that prescience you can kind of see into the future a few years. You founded, uh, you co-founded Graphcore 2016, right? And, uh, you know, like, what's your take on how AI has absolutely exploded since you've uh, started Graphcore? It's been an incredibly uh, upward, like, um, you know, incredibly explosive market. I remember sitting in the pub um, with my co-founder in 2012 mm -hmm. when we were first talking about the idea. Wow. I think the Google Brain Project had just done some interesting things. Um, AlexNet was just about um, to come out. Um, and it, it felt like this was a new, interesting area. And the, I think the thing with AI is you're not trying to tell a computer what to do step by step in a program. Um, it's a machine that's going to learn from data. More correctly, it learns from information, contextual data. And you know, the way that that has evolved, both in terms of the methods that get used to describe you know, how it will learn from information, um, going from needing labeled data through to self-supervised learning with some of the large language models, and now with other kinds of generative AI, you know, it's just been this amazing journey to see how that's grown. The size of the models has grown enormously from the original uh, AI models. And so, you know, but, it's, but we're really just at the very beginning. Right. I would say we're still in the foothills. Okay. I always use the analogy, it's a bit like um, we're maybe at Pac-Man, <laughs> you know, if you think about gaming, oh. right? You know, it's color, it's fun, it's pretty good. Yeah but nowhere near the three-dimensional you know, um, environments that people play games, you know, the immersive gaming environments that people have today. You know, I think there's still a lot um, to come here. 
Oh my goodness! So we're more Pac-Man than anything else. I was going to going to ask, like, you know, if you could compare it to something. Where are we? Because so much progress has been made, but you're saying it really is the foothills. Uh, that is fascinating. But I think you know you are one of the first people to see the potential of AI. You obviously, you know, have been talking about this for a long time. Uh, you know, your company has been at the forefront of this for a very long time. What you know, what inspired you to kind of turn your hand to uh, your new book? Because it's fascinating how AI thinks. What a question to even explore. Uh, what, what kind of inspired you to become this uh, best-selling author for the I Times? I guess great. two things. Number one, um, just lots of people asking me, you know, what is this AI thing? Yeah. You know, how does it work? Where's it come from? Um, I think people sometimes believe that somebody just came out with this magic thing and suddenly we got AI, but it's actually been going on since the 1950s. Um, so I wanted to try and kind of make clear where this technology came from, talk about some of the things that it could do. Um, but then also, you know, this is probably the most complex, powerful tool that humans have ever created. But my belief is we can still control it. And, you know, so I talk about that. And the key is humans are going to be in the loop with mm -hmm. AI. You know, this is, a, this is here to help us. Um, augment our human intelligence and, and humans will be in the loop and, and humans will need to control it. So it's, it's really, it's not the machine you need to worry about. It's kind of the people and what they're doing with it. If they try and do bad things, this is a powerful tool. You can do bad things, right? So, so yes. I, want, I really wanted to kind of write that down and help people understand you know, much more about the technology. Right. I mean, would you say, um, I mean, you, you, you strike me as a technology optimist and an AI optimist. Uh, would that be fair to say? I mean, it's, it's that thing of keeping humans in the loop at all stages, it's music to my ears. Is your book a warning or a, a manual? Or I, I say? would say I'm an AI realist, right? right? Um, there's a lot of people who talk about, you know, the alignment problem, for example. You know, some of the great yeah. thinkers around AI are now saying, you know, they're talking about this alignment problem of, you know, can we get AI to do what we've described, will it actually do what we've described, what we intended? Yeah. Um, and coming from a chip background, I sort of think of that as a verification problem that, you know, okay, this isn't like your normal software that you throw over the wall, you wait for some errors to come, and then you go and fix it. Actually, you're going to need to put a lot more effort up front to test it, to make sure it's doing what you, you, you expected, and, and do more kind of formal verification to check that it's actually following what you intended mm -hmm. from the description. So, you know, that's one of the things. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, we also need regulation around this. Um, you know, if you look at markets generally, you know, take banking, you know, you need central banks, you need laws um, that allow you to feel safe that when you make a transaction, you know, you're actually going to get paid. Yes. Um, we need kind of the same in AI because governments probably don't have the skills and we can't just hope that the big companies are going to look after us. You know, we probably need these in independent institutions. You know, I was at the Bletchley Park event that the UK government put on and I think that's a start in terms of putting some of these things in place where people are actually looking at what happens. And there's some obvious stuff. Um, you know, look at deep fakes. Mm -hmm. You know, is it right that somebody should steal your image and your voice? That should probably just be against the law. You know, why aren't we doing something about that? Is it right that an AI should decide, you know, to press the kill button on a, on a weapon? You know, that's, that shouldn't happen. And the UN has been looking at that actually since about 2014. And, and still governments are dragging their heels on it. And it seems obvious that, you know, no, there needs to be a human in the loop on those decisions. So some things we've just got to speed up and, and are quite obvious, I think. Yeah, well said. I mean, again, music to my ears, because you know, I think a lot of people kind of have a, a fear of AI and a fear of what it could potentially do. And a lot of this is you know, stoked by AI doomerism online. And a lot of that comes from some of the biggest AI companies, paradoxically enough. I mean, do you think um, you know, we need to be careful about giving too much power over AI to too few People, I like what you're talking about about you know organisations that are yep. kind of a, a layer in between, perhaps. I can't take credit for this, but I think it's a great line. 
you know, we need AI to help 8 billion people, not 8 billionaires, right? Yes. Um, yes. And so how do, we, how do we try and help people to understand it? And again, that's part of the root of my book, is to try and help people to understand more about it, where it's come from. Yeah. Also some of the limitations, because semiconductors that have allowed us to achieve this, um, you know, I don't think people realize, you know, the first semiconductor, the first integrated circuit, I should say, um, had four transistors built in 1960. Today, you can build a semiconductor with 100 billion transistors inside it. Yeah. And so, if over the same period, cars had got better as quickly as that, today, everyone would go home at 200 times the speed of light. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's like this technology that's hidden away. We don't really, it's in your credit card. There's yeah. a powerful semiconductor in your yeah. credit card. You know, it's there. Um, and it's that technology that has allowed this to happen. Semiconductors have allowed the internet, which gave us the information. It, when the internet got turned on properly in 1993, there was about 50 gigabytes of data. Now you do that you know, the internet passes that in a nanosecond. You know, the amount of information that is being exchanged around the planet, you know, has gone through the moon. So the combination of those two things, plus some methods that actually existed back in the 1980s but didn't work because there wasn't enough compute and there wasn't enough data, suddenly, you know, this thing has taken off. And, and now we're starting to work out, okay, how do we make this better? How do we improve it? And, and we're still, you know, finding our way on that. Right, and here's a seven trillion dollar question. I mean, what do you think might be coming next in the world of AI? This, this is a, an incredible upward trajectory. So, I think it's, um, we've had this in, these incredible breakthroughs, but what you're seeing is in London, mm -hmm. we have these cab drivers and they go through this thing called the knowledge to learn how to drive around London. And they're amazing, they do yeah. amazing things. And then you get Google Maps and it, basically can do the same thing. But Google Maps on its own doesn't really help you. you know, until you get a system solution that identifies where are the customers, where are the cars, how do you put those two things together, a kind of you know, um, tax, a proper online taxi service, yeah. um, you, know, you don't get that system solution. And I think where we are with, with AI is we're kind of those point solutions. We don't yet have the system solution. So take, take software development. People think like, large language models are going to improve software development. Well, of course they will, and they help you document and you know, improve your coding style, et cetera, et cetera. But what it's really going to do is allow everybody to program a computer, because you'll, you'll soon have these frameworks that will let you step through and, and direct what you want to achieve from the system. Say you want to write a game, you know, here are some, um, icons that you want to use, some, some characters, here's the background, here's the storyline that goes with it. You know, you're putting prompts in through this sort of framework that's guiding you, and very quickly, you'll create um, a game. And I think there's a great analogy because, you know, in the gaming environment, you've got um, companies like um, Unity that create these 3D um, graphics engines, and I think we'll see the same with AI. We'll, you know, we'll get these engines that will help us create applications, and they'll appear on your mobile phone, and they'll run in the cloud, and, and you'll be able to change them, you'll be able to direct them, you know, you'll be able to, you know, you, you could be a biologist and work on solving cancer. You don't have to learn how to program a computer to fold proteins and connect them to molecules to deliver the drug um, into, you know, the environment. Outstanding. I love these use cases where it really does feel like it's, it's a shortcut, it's superpowers for humans. Uh, humans are in the loop, but AI is giving it, you know, unlimited powers. It's incredible. Yeah. It, it, it's like a pencil and paper. Right. You don't sit down and solve a difficult maths problem in your head. You get out a pencil and paper and, you know, you, you write it out and you think it through, you know, and, and AI is going to be the same. It's just a really powerful pencil and paper that's going to help you solve problems that currently are out of reach. Yeah, I mean, you say that. I wouldn't uh, hold my hopes up to solving a difficult maths question with a pen and paper, <laughs> <laughs> but I think you probably could. But uh, coming back to your book now, uh, How AI Thinks, what a fascinating title. Do you think that the word think in that terms is, is something that we think about when we think about thinking? I mean, what does it mean for um, AI to think? 
it is, um, it's a controversial title. Yeah. And the word think is provocative on purpose. Yeah. Because what you've got to understand is language is an encoding scheme that we use to transfer information. So I would use words that hopefully you understand, hopefully people in the audience understand, but maybe you have a slightly different interpretation. Some words are pretty clear, you know, apple, I think we've got a good understanding of what an apple is. We've eaten one, we've held one, you know, we know what it looks like, feels like, ways, you know, all of that stuff. Whereas think or intelligence, you know, these are terms which are much harder and you might have a slightly different view of what thinking is. Um, and so I tried to describe in the book, for example, that playing tennis, you know, takes an enormous amount of intelligence, an enormous amount of thinking, but it's subconscious. Right. We, 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 you know, if you're good at tennis, which I'm not, but if you were good at tennis, you would be, you know, seeing this ball, working out where it's going to land, understand the spin, get in position, hit the right shot to return it down the line to win the point. And, and all of that happens without you really consciously engaging. It's like children learning to drive. You know, they start consciously incompetent, they become consciously competent, and then they become un subconsciously competent, and that's when they crash, right? Because yeah. they're, they're not properly engaged and thinking about it sometimes. And, and tennis is the same. And, and so all this thinking and all this stuff that we're doing is going on. And yet we think of intelligence and thinking as things like, you know, solving a cryptic crossword problem or playing chess. And when an AI plays chess, we suddenly say, oh, well, that's actually not very intelligent. That's actually quite easy problem for a, <laughs> for a computer to solve. But the stuff that's really difficult, actually, is all the stuff we find quite easy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what I try to do in the book is to explain some of these things. The fact, for example, that professional tennis players they have no better reaction times than probably you or I. They have better algorithms for sensing and seeing the way the ball goes. They have better algorithms for hitting the ball in the right way. And they're able to manipulate and use those much, much quicker. And that's what differentiates. It's not that they're you know, somehow physically better. They're mentally better um, than we are. That's fascinating. I mean, you kind of open up the whole can of worms that is human creativity. And I know there's a lot of generative AI, there's a lot of images being made, but they are, you know, they're, they're feeding from human creativity and kind of repackaging it. What do you think might happen to human creativity with AI coming to the fore? So artists have been inspired yes. by other artists forever. Um, I was listening to the radio recently about, you know, the Manchester sound. Oh, yeah. um, I think Liam Gallagher's got a new um, <laughs> album out or something. And so they're going on about this stuff and about how Joy Division was an inspiration to, you know, lots yes. of other bands and things. I'm kind of showing my age, but um, it's, it's inspiration. And yeah. so, you know, AI is going to help and maybe give us ideas, but ultimately it has to be humans who decide, is that good? Um, decide whether to change it, decide how it's going to be used. You know, yeah. humans need to be in the loop of that. And, you know, great designers will still be able to manipulate these systems and get better designs than probably you or I would be able to. Yeah, indeed. And creativity is really one of those foundational human activities, uh, which reminds me a bit of education. It's something we all do. We all go through different kinds of education. How do you think AI is going to impact how we experience education? Well. So I struggled in education. Yeah. I'm dyslexic. So, you know, learning to read yeah. was actually, you know, challenging for me. Eventually I kind of worked it out. My brain has kind of um, evolved in some way to make it a little bit better. And, and I wrote a book. Um, still can't spell. Um, but, you know, I was able to write a book. And the, I think, you know, this idea of three R's, I've never understood three R's because I think two of those words are misspelled from what I can tell. <laughs> yes. and, and, you know, this idea of rote learning, yes, we've got to learn, you know, English to be able to communicate or French or Spanish. Um, yes, we've got to learn maths to be able to communicate. You know, maths is just another encoding scheme. You know, numbers are an encoding scheme. Maths is an encoding scheme that lets us describe concept problems, difficult problems. Um, so we've got to learn those things. But what we really need to focus education on is curiosity, 
creativity and critical thinking, the three C's. Um, you know, because in a world where you've got AI that's going to help you find information, you know, find sources, put stuff in front of you of possible, you know, ways in which you could solve a problem, you know, you're going to need to add your creativity. You're going to have to be curious to kind of say, is that right? You know, where do I find more? And, and you're going to have to employ critical thinking to decide, is that right? Yeah. You know, well, or is it hallucinating? Is that, you know, because as Alan Turing said, you know, if something's going to be intelligent, it's going to make mistakes. Because it's making probabilistic judgments. And so it will not always be 100% correct. If everything was deterministic, if the world was deterministic, then that might work. But it's not. We need to do, use inductive reasoning, as Aristotle told us. And, and we really need to be able to recognize, you know, when we meet this person who we think we're going to spend the rest of our life with as a life partner, we don't know. We're making a guess, <laughs> yes. right? And a lot of us get it wrong. So true, so <laughs> true. That, that, that opens up a whole other can of worms. <laughs> hey, but listen, we've got a, a, a hall full of amazing delegates here. They're in business, they're startups, founders, investors. What do you think about the market opportunity around AI? Kind of real quick, are you, are you all in? Or what would you say? Oh, wow. Um, this is like the Industrial Revolution isn't it, yes. all over again. You know, the level of productivity improvement that AI is going to create is amazing. The thing we've all got to work out, you know, as humans, is how do we make sure that wealth is distributed, probably a bit more fairly yes. than we're currently doing, so that everybody benefits from the wealth that, that AI can create. And again, you know, part of the reason to write this book is to sort of help everybody understand about AI and, you know, our role in it, and, and I think that whole equation of how do we get people to benefit from AI, not just the big companies, but smaller companies in different countries and you know, broadly spread, that's a big challenge that we've got to sign up to, I think. Absolutely, that's a challenge and an invitation for all of you here and anybody streaming online or watching on demand. We've got zero seconds on the clock. I've got one real quick final, final question. Aside from buying your amazing new book, How AI Thinks, the Times bestseller, and aside from joining you at the Ask Me Anything session today on the Pitching Hub, Hall 8.0, and this is anything you ever wanted to know about AI, ask Nigel too. We've got the brilliant Ben Constantini there who's gonna be moderating it. So do join Ben and Nigel today. Pitching Hub, uh, it's three o'clock, is that right? Uh, it's it's so. on the agenda, easy up. Right, aside from the book, joining you at the AMA, what other things should everybody be doing here to get their hands in AI so they don't fear, uh, feel the FOMO, so they feel involved? Oh wow, you know, we had um, so we've got this wonderful guy at work, quite a large chap. Yeah. He's using AI to become a personal trainer to his son. I said, a personal trainer, have you looked at yourself? And it's like, you know, but, but AI helps him to understand, you know, how his son can use the machines, you know, what's the best way to, ex you Brilliant. know, and, th and that's just available through, through stuff that, you know, exists today. Right, so Have a go. Yeah. Try it out. Have a go, right, feel the FOMO and do it anyway. Absolutely brilliant. Listen, that's a great optimistic, realistic future for AI. Please join me in thanking the great Nigel Toon. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers. Brilliant, brilliant.